Hello guys and welcome to Fiber Optics course. This is going to be lecture number one in which we are going to introduce the field of fiber optics to you. My name is Mo Hasanovic. I'm representing here Indian River State College and the Laser Tech Center for Laser and Fiber Optic Education. We already talked a little bit about the fiber optics in our first course intro to photonics. We know that photonics represents the field that has everything to do with the light. And now we are moving into the subfield of photonics that is dealing with the transmission of light through so-called optical fibers. So once more, fiber optics represents the subfield of photonics that deals with the transmission of light through fibers. It's very important to understand there are many different aspects related to optical fibers. So we're talking about wide range of applications from uh, optical fiber manufacturing, fiber network installation, maintenance, repair, a design of complex fiber communication systems. So all these different aspects that have something to do with the optical fibers are going under the umbrella of fiber optics. Let's also emphasize that fiber optic communications represents also the field of telecommunications. We are dealing here with the telecommunications where the information from a source to a recipient has been sent by means of light pulses over the fiber optic data links. And as such, fiber optic communications is a growing field that en enters almost every aspect of our life and it's considered the technology of the 21st century. So being the technology of the 21st century means that there's a lot of opportunities out there for the career growth as well as many well-paid jobs for fiber optics technicians who have acquired a set of skills either through this course and many other courses and training in which you can learn more about fiber optics. There are many different applications out there where the fiber optics has found its place from uh, telecommunications, utilities, industrial systems, SCADA, wireless, medical applications, Let's just mention a few. Here we have an example of an Ethernet ring where different video cameras in the city have been connected using uh, optical fibers. Here's a bus configuration of a specific network. Then we have Ethernet that connects many different uh, end users and many different devices. Certain networks are also applied in the industry. We are dealing here with industrial internet. There's also SCADA systems where optical fibers are being used for supervisory control and data acquisition. In uh, wireless communication, the wireless towers are connected using optical fibers. Here we have a few uh, most recent applications such as fiber to the home, fiber to the building, and more generic FTTX. And then finally, we also have medical applications. So you can see a very broad range of applications where optical fibers are being utilized. This slide represents the fiber optic network in the United States. You can see many different fiber optic links that are connecting regionally from the West Coast to the East Coast. Fiber optic links are also now established in uh, regional, local communities. Just recently, many local communities are establishing fiber optic uh, network that connects the end users in the households to the rest of the fiber optic network. Finally, this slide here gives a brief glimpse of intercontinental fiber optic links that are connecting the uh, continents. Uh, these optical fiber cables are being laid on the bottom of the ocean and providing the communication between the na different nations on different continents. Now that we briefly introduced the field of fiber optics and all immense opportunities it offers to the people who are trained in this field, let's also briefly tour our fiber optic lab to expose you to the equipment that you're going to be trained on during the practical portion of this course. We are here in our photonics lab at Indian River State College main campus in Fort Pierce, Florida. My name is Moha Hasanovic, and this is a short video in which I'm going to introduce equipment that we are going to use in a practical portion of this course. All the equipment that we are going to be using is a, an industrial equipment, uh, meaning you're going to be trained on the equipment that you're going to be using out there in a fiber optic field as a fiber optic technician. We are going to be using the tools and equipment and uh, devices from uh, the market leaders in this field, uh, such as uh, Corning, uh, Fluke, uh, and similar. And again, what you're going to come across in this practical portion of the course is actually going to be the equipment that you're going to use out there uh, in your career or on your job as a fiber optic technician. In the first few lab experiment in the hands-on portion of this course, we are going to be focusing on the optical connectors. First, we are going to be learning about how to inspect the end face of the connector. We are going to emphasize 
the importance of the cleanliness of the end face of the connector and a negative impact of the dirt on the end face on the optical losses. And then as a practical portion, you are going to be learning how to visually inspect using uh, some of these tools, such as this uh, small optical uh, microscope made by Yamasaki. So you're gonna be inspecting the end face and then also learning proper uh, procedures for both the dry and the wet cleaning of the end face of the connector. One of the important skills that you would want to develop as a fiber optic technician is also properly installing the connector onto the optical fiber. Uh, we are going to be talking about a few different uh, techniques that are used to mount the connector, such as uh, an aerobic method and a few other. And then we are going to be introducing this uh, Unicam Corning kit that you're seeing here that we're going to be using in a hands-on portion of the connector installation. So you're going to learn how to properly establish the end phase of the fiber and properly install it in the connector so that you avoid any kind of air gaps that may result in uh, optical losses. So you'll be introduced to the tools such as uh, the wire strippers to be used to remove uh, different layers including the buffer as well as uh, the coating on the optical fiber. You're going to use this small tool here to properly cleave the fiber and then finally the last tool that's part of this uh, Unicam kit is the tool to be used to properly install the connector onto the optical fiber. So this is going to be a lab that's gonna take a few hours during which you're gonna be practicing the way to uh, properly prepare optical fiber, the end face of the optical fiber to properly cleave it, and then finally to uh, install the connector in a proper way uh, that would minimize the losses, the interface between the optical fiber and the connector. And then the next portion of the hands-on experience is going to be fiber optic splicing. So we're going to be learning how to splice two fibers. We're going to be using these two splicers here, one made by Fujikura and another one made by uh, Sumitomo. Uh, so these are industrial type uh, of uh, fiber optic splicers. Uh, so you're going to learn how to properly prepare the end faces of the two fibers and then how to properly mount them into the fixture on each of these two fiber optic splices and finally to perform the fiber optic splicing as well as uh, the installation of uh, the plastic uh, protective uh, buffer onto your fiber optic splice. Both of these uh, fiber optic splices have a nice small screen that are going to enable you to monitor fiber optic alignment during the process of splicing as well as the process of splicing when uh, the arc is being produced and the two, uh, two uh, optical fibers are spliced. So this is an important skill that, you, that you're going to develop on uh, in this industrial type of uh, fiber optic splicers uh, during the practical portion of this course. And then finally, in the second half of the hands-on portion of this course, we're going to be performing fiber optic measurements. After learning how to install the connector and how to properly splice the two fibers, you're going to be establishing your small fiber optic links with the two connectors on each side, and then performing different types of measurements. We're going to emphasize the importance of an accurate and reliable measurement and then move over to the practical portion of the fiber optic measurement. We're going to be performing two measurements, tier one and tier two. The tier one measurement will be conducting using uh, optical source and optical meter by uh, Corning. We're going to be characterizing the optical loss over the fiber optic link in terms of the optical loss. And then we're going to move over uh, to the optical time domain reflectometry or tier 2 measurements uh, that we're going to be performing on a fluke uh, optical OTDR or optical time domain reflectometer. So we're going to be introducing the whole concept of uh, optical time domain reflectometry and its advantages over the regular T1 uh, measurement. And once you're introduced to all these different types of uh, measurement devices, we also have a replica of the real fiber optic link here at the main campus of Indian River State College. Uh, on that replica of the fiber optic link, you're going to be performing uh, real-time measurements of a few different types of fiber optic links and different scenarios. Some of the fiber optic links will be damaged, they will be of a different length, so you would be using some of this equipment uh, to properly characterize fiber optic link of different lengths and different scenarios on it. So this is a short overview of the equipment that we are going to use in a hands-on portion of this course. This is uh, the most fun part of the course uh, through which you're going to have an opportunity to learn and develop the skills uh, of a fiber optic technician, hands-on skills. And at this point, and I'm looking to seeing you all here at the main campus of Indiana River State College. Now that we briefly introduced the fiber optics course as well as a hands-on portion of it, let's start with the theory. In this first lecture, we are going to review some of the concepts that have been covered in the previous course, Introduction to Photonics. So let's see what are the basic properties of light and how they can be applied to the field of fiber optics. 
there are a few learning outcomes that we need to uh, achieve today. As a result of this lecture, you should be able to understand the nature of light propagation, at least on a basic level. We're going to spend some time discussing the electromagnetic theory of light. And finally, we're going to spend a, a significant amount of time talking about different properties of light. In the field of fiber optics, we are using light as a, a medium uh, that carries information. Uh, along some sort of guiding structure, which uh, in this case is uh, known as uh, optical fiber. So in order to properly understand uh, the behavior of light along an optical fiber, we are going to start this uh, review of the basic properties of light by discussing uh, the propagation of light and uh, some of the uh, important uh, factors that would uh, determine the behavior of light uh, in a specific medium. So there two basic factors that need to be analyzed and understood. One are the properties of the light and another one are the properties of the medium. So the medium is a supporting structure and light is uh, going to be uh, the uh, carrier of the information that is going to travel through that medium. So there is going to be certain interaction between uh, the light as an as a, as a information carrier on one side and the medium as a supporting structure through which light is going to propagate. So we are going to uh, visit each of these two uh, basic uh, aspects of the light propagation and try to understand how they affect uh, the behavior of light and uh, its information information capacity uh, when light uh, carries information either in a free space or uh, specifically in the case of fiber optics uh, as the light propagates along an optical fiber. In order to understand the basic properties of light, we are going to start with the basic question of what is light. This question uh, preoccupied many scientists throughout the history uh, of, uh, of uh, science and today uh, at this level of, uh, of knowledge, we're looking at the light uh, as a form of electromagnetic energy that has both uh, wave and particle properties. It turns out that certain uh, phenomena that are related to the light can be explained only if you're looking at light as a wave, uh, while some other phenomena can be explained only if we are looking at the light uh, as uh, consisting of uh, many small particles. So for example, when the light travels to the space or passes through uh, small openings, it is going to behave like a wave, similar to like water waves or sound waves to a certain level. So in other words, uh, uh, light is going to behave like uh, as if it's made up of uh, connected electric and magnetic fields that are vibrating and traveling together. On the other side, there's, uh, there are other phenomena that cannot be explained by looking at light as a wave. Uh, certain phenomena such as absorption, uh, uh, in other words, uh, the way how uh, the light is uh, interacting with the medium by uh, reducing its power and uh, transferring its energy uh, uh, onto the, onto the uh, medium can only be explained if you're looking at the light as uh, a whole a bunch of small particles that are interacting with the particles of the supporting medium. This slide here uh, lists important parameters that are going to be used to describe the properties of light. The most important are the wavelength, the frequency, the period, the amplitude, the speed of light, the phase, and also the coherence, the polarization, and finally the energy of light. On the slides that follow, we are going to discuss each of these parameters individually, and we are going to try to uh, properly understand them as they play a very important role in the field of photonics and also in the field of fiber optics. So let us first talk a little bit about the wavelength. We have already mentioned that light behaves as an electromagnetic wave. What do we mean by wave? What is a wave? How can we, how can we define a wave? Uh, a simple explanation is that you can look at a wave as some sort of disturbance that uh, takes place, that occurs both in the space and in the time. So for example, if you're looking at the water waves, if you look at the waves uh, on the ocean, you are going to look at the disturbance, you're going to look at the peaks and valleys that are distributed uh, along the space. In other words, at different locations, you're going to have a peak or a crest and some other locations you are going to have a valley or the minimum. Uh, similar uh, disturbance, similar, si similar uh, 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 vibration uh, also occurs in time. For, so for example, if you are anchored in a boat at the same location over time, that boat's gonna be moving up and down. So at certain points in time, you're gonna be at a peak or at a crest 
and then at some at some some other time you're gonna be uh, moving down into the valley or at, uh, at a minimum minimum position so that's what we consider a wave uh, in order for a wave to be a wave there has to be a disturbance both in space and in, t and in time and that disturbance can be a uh, distur disturbance of different types of quantity if we are looking at the ocean wave we are talking about disturbance of water if we are looking at a sound wave then we are talking about disturbance of air molecules in this specific case of light we are talking about an electromagnetic wave we are talking about a disturbance of uh, so-called electric field and a magnetic field you can to a certain extent correlate electric field uh, to the voltage and magnetic field to the current so if you're looking at a light as an electromagnetic wave we are talking about a disturbance of uh, of, of the current and the voltage in space and in time so in order to properly describe that disturbance that change uh, from a uh, from a minimum to a maximum uh, uh, in space and in time we are going to use different parameters to describe those one of the parameters is a wavelength so what you see here on this slide on the bottom is a some sort of wave wavy or uh, if you want to be a more specific sinusoidal cu curve where you uh, can um, notice a whole bunch of uh, peaks positive peaks or crests uh, and also uh, uh, a series of negative peaks uh, the wavelength is defined as the distance in space between the two neighboring crests, between the two neighboring peaks. So if you're measuring the distance in space, we said that a wave is a disturbance in space in addition to being a disturbance in time. So in this case here, we are considering disturbance over the space. That's why on the, along the x-axis, uh, uh, we, we are using a parameter of distance. So if you're measuring the distance in space, between the two crests or the two peaks, that distance is so-called wavelength. That's how we are defining the wavelength. So the wavelength represents, again, the distance over which the wave repeats itself, distance in, in space. Uh, we are using the Greek let letter lambda to describe the wavelength, and obviously the units that are going to be used to describe the wavelength uh, are going to be uh, units of uh, distance be it uh, uh, meters or uh, uh, smaller uh, units such as micrometers in the case of light nanometers uh, of course you all can also use uh, 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 british units you can use use uh, inches or uh, mils etc so again the wavelength represents the parameter that describes the distance in space between the two crests or two peaks or uh, two maxima uh, in a, in some uh, sort of a wave in this case in a ca uh, 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 in this case uh, light uh, as uh, an electromagnetic wave we have already elaborated uh, the wave behavior of light and we also define a wave as a disturbance of a certain quantity uh, both in space and in time. On the previous slide, we were focusing on the disturbance in space, and we defined the wavelength as the distance in space between the two peaks or the two uh, maxima of a wave. On this specific slide, we are uh, shifting the gears uh, to time domain. In other words, we are talking about the disturbance or vibration uh, in time. So we are still uh, dealing with a, with a similar wavy or sinusoidal curve, but the fundamental difference here is that along the x-axis we are representing the time as opposed to the space or the distance uh, that we uh, um, had on the previous slide. So what we can uh, observe here is that over time the, 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 the uh, value of a certain quantity, uh, in this case electromagnetic uh, field, is going to be changing from uh, the positive peak to the negative peak to the positive peak to the negative peak, etc. So we are having a disturbance or vibration of an of a electromagnetic field over time. And the parameter that is going to describe this behavior in time, this uh, 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 oscillation in time, is going to be the period. So the period is basically the distance in time between the two peaks. In other words, if we are measuring uh, how much it takes to go from one positive peak to the next positive peak, that, uh, uh, that uh, duration is going to be defined as a period. 
the number of uh, cycles or number of uh, of the peaks that occur within one second is so-called so frequency. So there is a certain correlation between the period and the frequency. The period represents the interval of time over which the wave repeats itself, uh, while the frequency represents the number of cycles of the wave in one second. Uh, we are using the Greek letter nu, uh, or very often uh, a letter f, uh, to represent the, represent the quantity of frequency. At this point, we are also going to introduce uh, another very important parameter that describes the light, and that is the speed of light. So, light propagates uh, through a, a specific medium at a certain speed. It turns out that the speed of light is a, is a, a constant in a specific medium, so if you're looking at a vacuum or uh, uh, air, then uh, the speed of light is going to be equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that is uh, a constant that is going to be uh, very frequently used in photonics and it's to be remembered. So again, the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant that is equal to 3 times uh, 10 to the 8 meters per second or 300 million meters per second. Let us summarize what we covered so far. We have uh, defined a wave as a uh, a certain disturbance that takes place both in time and in space. In order to properly describe the properties of a wave, we are introducing two parameters. We have introduced the wavelength that would properly uh, describe the disturbance in space. In other words, the wavelength is going to be the distance between the two peaks in a wave. And uh, in order to properly describe disturbance uh, uh, in time, we have introduced the period uh, as an uh, interval in time to complete one full cycle. We have also mentioned that the light represents an electromagnetic wave. In other words, in the case of light, electric field and magnetic field are uh, uh, or vibrating or oscillating in space and time. Let us now focus our attention to another important parameter of light and that's the speed of light. On the previous slides we uh, talked about the speed of light being a constant and uh, uh, being equal to 300 uh, million meters per second in air or vacuum. It's also important to uh, mention here that the light travels uh, in uh, straight lines uh, similar to any kind of other electromagnetic uh, signal. So light pretty much behaves in a similar way uh, as uh, an electromagnetic signal that is being used to uh, transfer information from your cell phone or smartphone to the tower is just that the frequency or the wavelength of uh, uh, those two types of electromagnetic waves is going to be the different different so again the speed of light is approximately equal to three times 10 to the 8 meters per second or 300 uh, millions uh, of meters per second or uh, if you uh, wish it is it is actually equal to uh, 186,000 miles per second. It's important to uh, mention that this is uh, only in a free space, either in the air or vacuum, and that the speed of light is going to change if uh, the light uh, uh, moves from one medium uh, into another. So the speed of light depends upon the medium through which the light passes. The uh, uh, highest speed is the speed of light in air or in the vacuum, and we are going to see on the slides that fo follow that slide it's going to actually reduce its speed if uh, it passes from air or vacuum into some other medium such as water or glass, etc. So this is very important to understand because it's going to have a certain profound uh, effects uh, in fiber optics since we are using glass uh, uh, as a material to make the core of, a, op of an optical fiber that is going to be used as a light guiding region through which the light is going to propagate and carry information from one side uh, to the other side uh, from, a, from the transmitter uh, to a receiver. Here we have a, a very clear comparison between uh, three waves at three different frequencies. We are seeing uh, a wave at frequency of 4 Hertz uh, on the top and then we have a wave uh, whose frequency is 2 Hertz in the middle and finally the wave whose frequency is 1 Hertz on the bottom. So again 
the frequency is basically equal to the number of cycles uh, completed within one second. So four hertz means that four cycles are completed completed within one second. Two hertz means that two cycles are completed within one second, and finally one hertz is uh, uh, the meaning of one hertz is that one cycle is completed within one second, which is clearly uh, shown on this uh, slide. This slide uh, in the bottom right corner also gives you uh, two important formulas that are to be remembered uh, that uh, very clearly uh, establish the correlation between the three parameters that we have introduced so far. Uh, wavelength, the frequency, and the speed of light. Uh, it's important to mention that these formulas at this point, you know, the way how they have been written can be applied only for air or vacuum. So uh, wavelength, uh, we are using the letter of la letter lambda, uh, the speed of light you are using a small letter c, and finally the frequency we are using the Greek letter nu. So there is a correlation between these three uh, in the sense that, for example, the first uh, formula on the top uh, basically uh, is uh, uh, stating that the wavelength of light in a, uh, in a vacuum or air is equal to the ratio of the speed of light C and the frequency uh, of that wave of that light uh, no. This slide dives a little deeper into the whole uh, aspect of, uh, of an electromagnetic wave. We have already described the light as an electromagnetic wave and uh, we said that an electromagnetic wave is a wave where uh, disturbance uh, uh, occurs in space and time and uh, the quantity that uh, that vibrates or disturbs uh, is electric field and magnetic field again electric field can be looked uh, at as um, voltage and magnetic field can be looked at as a current on the bottom of this slide we have a three-dimensional representation of an electromagnetic wave. We said that an electromagnetic wave consists of an electric field and a magnetic field. Electric field uh, here is shown in an orange color uh, and it's shown here as oscillating vertically to form so-called electric wave and then the magnetic field is uh, shown here in a purple color and shown here as oscillating horizontally to form a magnetic wave. So these two uh, quantities, electric field and magnetic field, are perpendicular to each other. They're at right angle relative to each other. What we described here is so-called transverse wave. Uh, it turns out that there are different uh, types of uh, waves. There are so-called longitudinal waves and there's also so-called transverse waves. What do we mean by transverse wave? If you're looking at these two quantities uh, that describe electromagnetic wave, namely electric field and magnetic field. They are perpendicular to each other and they are also perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. That's an important property of a so-called transverse wave. So the oscillation is basically taking place in a plane that is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Uh, in the case of an electric field, we see that oscillation is taking place uh, in, a, in, a, uh, like in a vertical direction Right? And then uh, the, the, the uh, oscillation of the magnetic field is taking place in a, in a horizontal direction, and those two directions are perpendicular to the axis of the propagation. In the case of a, a longitudinal waves on the other side, we'll see that the disturbance of or oscillation is going to be basically taking place along the direction of the propagation. So that is a fundamental difference between a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave. Here we can see a short demo of an electromagnetic wave where uh, yellow arrows represent the electric field and the blue arrows represent the magnetic field. We see that the yellow arrows are, uh, are uh, oscillating in a, in a vertical direction. The blue arrows are oscillating in a horizontal direction and both yellow and the blue arrows are perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of this wave that happens to be in a, in the a direction of the x axis uh, as shown here so once more let's uh, once more let's repeat this uh, demo to uh, to see how an uh, electromagnetic wave looks uh, in space and time